read your bio real quick, Dr. Elgin, and then we can get going. I kind of grabbed a few highlights out of it. Still, yeah, it's, it's still please, fairly please, long. Please don't read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I can give the highlights if you like, but go ahead. <laughs> right. All right. No worries. Uh, all right, we'll get going. So uh, Dr. Elgin is second generation surveyor raised in St. James, Missouri, and, and is his late parent's surveying business located in Rolla. After high school, Dick joined the Army and went through helicopter flight school and made a warrant officer and spent 1969 in Vietnam flying the Hughes and the Huey. Following the Army, he received a BS and an MS from Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, and he received his PhD from the University of Arkansas. Leaving Arkansas, he joined the Faculty and Department of Civil Engineering as an assistant professor in 1980 and through 1984 and is now an adjunct professor. Um, 1984 to 2008, Dick was the owner and president of Elgin Surveying and Engineering. Semi-retired, Dick currently works for Archer Elgin Engineering, Surveying and Architecture. He is a former member of the Missouri Board of Architects, Professional Engineers, Professional Land Surveyors, and Professional Landscape Architects. Past president of the Missouri Society of Professional Surveyors, a member of both SNT and the University of Arkansas Academy of Civil Engineers, and a member of SNT's Order of Golden Sile. Shillelagh. Shillelagh. Oh, there you go. I missed that up. And, the, and on the board of directors for S&T's Alumni Association. Uh, Dick is the author of the United U.S. Public Land Survey System for Missouri, Riparian Boundaries for Alaska. Dick was Alaska or Arkansas's. Ar Arkansas. Arkansas. I keep screwing that up. Arkansas surveying and mapping expert in the state riparian boundary dispute with Missouri or Mississippi. Holy moly, I'm really butchering this. Uh, this and uh, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, see Arkansas versus Mississippi, 471 U.S. 377, 1985. Uh, he is an avid collector and researcher of early American surveying equipment, which is why we have you on today, and owns one of the largest private collections of such equipment in the United States. So after I butchered all that, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Elgin, for joining us. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Trent, and hello to all you uh, uh, online folks. Uh, I'm in Rolla, uh, Missouri. Uh, some of y'all may know Rolla as the U.S. one of the, well, the 17-state Mid-Continent Map Center for the USGS um, is here, along with some other, well, the old Bureau of Mines used to be here, so, uh, and Fort Leonard Wood, if any of y'all were ever at Fort Wood, is just right down the road. So I'm coming to you from Rolla, and uh, uh, Trinidad asked if I'd talk about my instrument collection today, which I'm uh, happy to do. Uh, I've been collecting since I was a little kid. My parents were pack rats and collectors of everything. My father before me was a surveyor, of course. And uh, one of the rules when we were growing up as kids, everybody had to collect something. And uh, I've enforced that rule with my kids and my grandkids. And it's a, it's a great habit uh, uh, obsession to get into. So this is about my instrument collection. And thanks very much for the, for the bio sketch there, Trent. But uh, some of y'all, if you're old enough, you may uh, you may remember uh, the, the Leets or Sokia ephemeris that, uh, that I was co-author of. Uh, it started in 1985, was the first edition. Last edition was in 2008. Of course, GPS has supplanted the need for uh, celestial observations, but it was fun for a while if you're... Uh, uh, if you were practicing in those days, you probably used the Leets or Sokia ephemeris and some of the software that uh, Dave Knowles and Joe Senny and I wrote as well. It was a pretty good run back in those days. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> um, today it's about uh, early American surveying instruments. And as you all have questions or observations, I think you I, either you can unmute yourself or Trent can and just chime in and uh, don't 
be bashful at all about interrupting and bringing up a question, particularly perhaps while the instrument is uh, uh, is on the screen. So feel free to feel free to jump in there. So all these uh, all the slides that I'm going to go through are instruments uh, from my collection. Uh, there's one or two exceptions to that. Uh, but these are instruments that I've collected over the years, uh, and I have quite a quite a pile of them of them at the end of the I think the last slide here gives you some idea of uh, how many instruments that I've uh, obtained and collected and researched. not only not only just collecting them, but also, of course, it's the hunt and it's the research uh, about the maker. So I'll start with uh, the Chandley family. The Chandleys are probably one of the most preeminent uh, uh, early American makers, uh, early Virginia makers. So this is uh, a Chandley compass. Uh, it's on a little walnut stand. Somebody, sometimes folks say, well, you know, what's it sitting on? Well, that's just a turned walnut stand. It's not, uh, but anyway, so here's a Chandley, a Chandley compass. And this would have been, Chandley was in Winchester, Virginia, making instruments, oh, from about, from about the late 1700s. He died in uh, 1821. So this instrument would date about, uh, about 1800. Uh, as was his custom across the bottom of the compass face was uh, uh, G. Chanley Winchester, now, of course, uh, Winchester, uh, Virginia. This is a very, very, very ornate uh, instruments, highly decorated. These uh, folks that made these instruments were just absolute first class craftsmen. And so here we have uh, an American Eagle holding a banner for the instrument uh, for whom the instrument was made, John Orndorff, who was a early Virginia maker. Uh, you can see there, there's embedded uh, level vials there. This is the north end uh, of the compass, of course. I'll talk a little bit about this, but what you're looking at, all that, all of this, uh, all of what we're looking at there, all this decoration, that's all engraved. Uh, so he's taken uh, a knife or a stylus, a sharp object, and has carved that into the brass face of the compass. And I'll show you some better examples as we go along here. But um, uh, Chanley was a uh, exquisite maker, one of the best. There were several that are kind of head and shoulders above uh, some of the others. This instrument has a uh, two outkeepers. There on the left, the M, that's an outkeeper for miles. And then on the right, that's an outkeeper for poles. And so there's a little button or a switch, a knob on the bottom of the compass, uh, which you rotate you rotate a little dial that keeps track of how many poles you've uh, chained and how many miles you've come. It's an early data collector and of course no batteries involved uh, in this data collector um, at all. Um, Goldsmith also made clocks. Most of these early makers made clocks. If you can make a clock, you can certainly make a compass. And the hands on this Goldsmith Chanley clock uh, are very similar to the hands on the outkeeper. So the, uh, you know, the hands on the clock, same as what's on uh, the compass. Goldsmith was part of a family. And here's the, here's the family. In the upper left, we uh, we have Abel Cotty. He immigrated to the U.S. to America from uh, from Ireland, and he's credited with building the first clock in America um, about 1707 or so. So Abel Cotty, and then he had an apprentice, Benjamin Chanley Sr not only was an apprentice, but also became Abel Cotty's son-in-law. So Benjamin Chanley Sr. 
he had a son, Benjamin Chanley Jr. And then Benjamin Chanley Jr. had several uh, offsprings, but the, the, the three sons that were also instrument makers were Goldsmith and then Ellis, Ellis Chanley and Isaac Chanley. And so the Chanley family, all these were instrument makers except for Abel Cotty, and they were all clockmakers. So uh, quite a uh, group of interesting uh, instrument makers and clockmakers. Uh, one of their descendants in about 1941 or so wrote a book about uh, the Chanley family. And these, these folks were all Quakers. The name of the book is Six Quaker Clock Makers. So say that five times in a, in a row very quickly and uh, see how tongue-tied you get. Six Quaker Clock Makers. And it's a very, very good book. Now long out of print, only found in rare bookstores. There is a reprint of it that the Pennsylvania Historical Society made many years ago. I think it's out of print now um, as well. But all these folks were, uh, all these folks were interested, were instrument makers and they all made just exquisite uh, instruments. And here's a Isaac Chanley compass in a little coffin uh, box. Uh, this is a vernier compass. So I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But uh, this instrument was made by Isaac Chanley, one of the brothers. And uh, there's a little story behind my collecting this particular instrument uh, that revolves around what's on the screen now. But one time, quite a few years ago, I think it was a Thursday night, I got a phone call at home and the gentleman said, are you that guy that collects those instruments? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, well, uh, he was in Indiana and he said a, a friend of his suggested that he call me because I collect these instruments. And I said, well, describe the instrument to me. And he says, well, he says, uh, it was made in Nottingham, England, and it was made by Isaac Chand. And uh, right away, I knew it was not made in Nottingham, England, and it was not Isaac Chan, but it, of course, he did, I didn't have any pictures. He was describing it over the phone, but I knew it had to be Isaac Chanley, something, you know, he couldn't quite read it or something. And the Nottingham is Nottingham, Maryland, what today is Nottingham, Maryland. So I knew this was one of the Chanley brothers compasses. Uh, Isaac Chanley compasses are very, very rare. Uh, so I said, well, I said, you wanna sell it? And he said, yeah. So we made a deal over the phone right there. And he says, well, how am I gonna get it to you? And I said, well, what are you doing for breakfast uh, Saturday morning? And he said, well, nothing. And he lived uh, essentially a suburb of uh, Indianapolis. That was on a Thursday night. I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't, didn't get anything done on Friday, but Friday, Friday at night, I drove to Indianapolis and was sitting in his driveway, ready to buy the compass, of course, and buy him, uh, buy him breakfast. So that's what you have to do when you're on the hunt for these, uh, for these instruments. Very, very rare. Um, now, let's see, as I go through this, I find that sometimes, you know, folks want to know, well, what is this thing worth? What are we talking about here? How rare is it? Well, these Chanley compasses, um, oh, let, let's, let me, I'll give you a price that if I saw one, this is what I would offer for it. Now, I get a lot of inquiries, and you all may have inquiries, and I'm happy to, to, to field them. Folks, want to know, well, this, this instrument is available, or I've seen this instrument at antique store, or I've seen it online, what's it worth? And there's a lot of those kind of face, those kind of postings on Facebook. And so what I do, I say, well, I'll give you two prices, or somebody wants to know what's the instrument worth, I'll give you two prices. I'll give you the price that I would pay for it that I would pay for it. If it was offered to me what I would pay for it, and then I'll give you the price that if I owned it, what I would want for it. 
So that's really the range. Now, I have a lot of instruments, and so my offer price is probably going to be low because, you know, I probably have some of those instruments before. So the, the offer price is low. And the uh, what I would sell it for, well, I'm not in the instrument uh, buy, sell business. So any instrument that I sold, well, you know, I would sell it, but I'd want kind of full retail for it. So for example, uh, these Chandley compasses, if any of the, if any of the Chandley compasses became uh, available, well, let's see, I'm going to kind of go out on a limb here, but I would, uh, my offer price would be probably something in the, oh, four, six, seven, eight thousand dollar range. And depending on which maker and the condition, does it have the original box, this and that, Oh, my sell price would probably be, oh, 12,000, 15,000, something in that range. So that'd give you some idea. Now that's on these Chandley Brothers compasses. Now, some of these others that I'll show you here in a little bit, those, those prices be quite, quite high. But for one of these rare Virginia makers, you know, they're on a, on a terrible day, they're worth three or four or five, six thousand dollars on a good day, they'd be worth about twice that. So that gives you some idea kind of what we're what we're dealing with here. Uh, here's another Goldsmith Chanley compass. This is a standard kind of a garden variety compass, uh, just G Chanley down at the bottom, Winchester, not highly decorated does not have the name of the person for whom it was made. Most Chanley compasses do have the, the name on them, but this is, this is not. This is kind of a garden variety standard a Goldsmith Chanley compass. But even this one, I would, I would offer, oh, $1,000, $1,500. If I was selling it, I'd want, oh, three or $4,000, something in that, even for this kind of low, you know, kind of garden variety uh, Chanley. Uh, this is a Graves compass. He was the successor to Chanley when Chanley died. Uh, actually, Graves was an apprentice to Chanley at his death in 1821. And so Graves ended up with all the, all of what was left of the stock from, uh, from, uh, from Goldsmith Chanley there in uh, Winchester. So Graves is a, a well-known maker, uh, known as the successor to Chanley. Now let's talk about the more common, uh, most prolific makers in America. Of course, uh, W and L.E. Gurley, Troy, New York, established about 1854, um, uh, went out in, uh, oh, the mid 70s or so when Gurley got bought out by Teledyne. Uh, of course, they made more engineering and surveying equipment than, than anybody else in the US. This card says 1845, that's, that's actually a predecessor firm is that date, but as W and L.E. Gurley about 1854. Here are the two gentlemen, uh, William on the left uh, and uh, Louis Ephraim on the right, W and L.E. Gurley. They were political men. Uh, William was the pres president of Rensselaer Polytech in, uh, in Troy, New York, which is just literally right across the street uh, from the Gurley uh, factory there uh, in Troy. Uh, he was kind of the politician, and Louis Ephraim was kind of the businessman, the gentleman on the right. So those are the two, uh, uh, the two gentlemen. Uh, they made thousands of uh, standard compasses. Uh, this is a standard American uh, compass, a vernier compass, meaning that the declination can be set off in the instrument. Uh, the, the instructions for the surveys of the public lands, the lines were to be run on the true meridian per the 
May 20th, uh, 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 18, uh, 1785, a uh, land ordinance. So you put the ver you put the variation in the compass. So although the needle pointed to magnetic north, the compass sights were aligned to true north. Uh, so this so this instrument has a vernier on it. There it has an outkeeper, cross level vials to level it up, and the sight vanes. Uh, these instruments were made girly. They were in the girly catalog up until the 1930s. Technology didn't change. Uh, so if you can imagine, you know, literally the same instrument could have been made in the early 1800s and up till 1930, it hadn't changed very much at all. The technology just, you know, a compass is a compass. It's a slave to the Earth's gravity, uh, it has a few features, and that's, a, that's the standard American compass. Uh, uh, standard old plain uh, girly vernier compass oh if i were buying them i'd want to buy this one's in good shape it has uh, uh it has the knuckle joint there in the box and the plumb bob if i were buying it i'd want to pay oh five six seven hundred dollars if i was selling this one i'd want eleven twelve thirteen hundred dollars for it uh something like that why the uh, why the big price difference between Chanley and Gurley? Hmm. Yeah, well, good question. The uh, you know why is a, a Chanley worth five thousand and a Gurley's worth five hundred? Right. And to to the serious, well, a couple of things about it. Most folks by looking at it, you couldn't tell the difference between the two. I mean, they have the same features, you know, they, they look the same, they operate the same, but to the collector, uh, the value is in that maker. Uh, the rarity, uh, the girly is much, I mean, the, uh, the Goldsmith Chanley is much more ornate from a craftsmanship standpoint. You know, it's, it's way, way, way better than the, than the girly. Girlies, there's, prolific maker you know there were thousands of them made there's probably for goldsmith chanley there's probably only i know of about 19 20 maybe 25 goldsmith chanley compasses out there oh, so gotcha. the, the okay. rarity yeah uh, okay yeah. so here's the standard uh, vernier compass uh this one also is a is a girly uh, another girly standard compass. This one is a plain compass. It has no vernier on it. So you cannot set off the declination. Uh, they're called plain, no vernier, plain. Uh, so here you are a slave to a magnetic, uh, to magnetic direction. Has an outkeeper. This is a very small compass. There's nothing much for scale but this is a very, very small instrument. This is a railroad compass. They call it a compass, but it has a cut circle on it. So really it operates like a transit. It has a circle and a vernier uh, and they call it a railroad compass. Why, where it got that name, nobody is quite for sure but they're standard, they're called railroad compasses, but it has a compass face, but it also has a circle uh, like a transit, a cut circle like a transit does. This is a uh, pocket railroad compass. This is a very small instrument and it too has a cut circle. Uh, and when you, it has a telescope. So when you put the thing together, uh, you collapse the sight vanes and the telescope goes on top. This instrument, the, the diameter of the circle or the, the length of the needle is oh, about maybe three and a half inches or so. So this is a very, very, very small compass. And it's called a pocket railroad compass. Uh, pocket because of its size and it has a cut circle. So it turns angles uh, just like a transit. Very, very rare. This would be 
oh, full retail would be three or four thousand dollars, something like that. Uh, Gurley made everything. This looks like a pair of binoculars, but it's not. It's actually, it's a hand level. It's a monocular hand level. And they had hundreds of, uh, of patents. They had ideas for instruments and patented them uh, all the time. And there's one of them. That's what they, uh, that's what they look like. They made um, engineering equipment they made current meters they made they made everything of course we surveyors know them more and they made mostly of course uh, surveying instruments uh, this is a girly uh, uh, transit but it was made for queen and so occasionally you you run across instruments that are marked this way uh, maker made them. They made them for a distributor. Queen was a distributor in uh, in Philadelphia, so occasionally you see instruments marked uh, marked that away. Now here is the here's the the device that made this. This is the this is the machine that made the machine. This is one of the girly dividing engines, and so this thing it cut circles. That's what it does a dividing engine. Uh, it cuts, it divides like a, a plate on a transit or a plate on a compass into however many pieces you want. You know, 720 if it's marked, you know, every, uh, every half degree. Uh, so this, this is the device that cut the circles. Uh, there, Gurley only had seven of them ever. This was one of the seven that they used. This one was made in 1907. No telling how many hundreds and hundreds of circles uh, this thing cut. And of course, the smart guy was the guy who made the, who made the dividing engine that cuts the circles. Very, uh, very difficult to do, my mechanical engineering friends uh, tell me. Uh, but here's kind of some of the mechanism over on the left is where you put the plate, and then this thing whirs and jerks and goes around, and the little stylus thing in the middle there is drug across the plate, and it cuts the circle. So very, very rare. Uh, little collecting story on this one. This has a cast iron frame, and the gentleman I bought it from in Pennsylvania uh, called me and fellow collector. I don't know if I want to buy it. I said, yeah, I'll buy it. And uh, he said, now you have to tell me when you're coming up here because I've got to get a wrecker truck to lift this device up and put it in the back of your pickup. I said, oh, is it that big? He said, oh, yeah. So I have to know so I can have a wrecker here. And so we made arrangements. And when I got there, here was the wrecker truck and they strapped this thing and lifted it up and set it in the back of the pickup. So it's, it's huge. I don't know what it would weigh. It probably weigh, I'm thinking, oh, maybe a thousand pounds, 1500 pounds, something like that. It's an absolute monster. So when I got it home, I arranged uh, for a, a wrecker truck to be there to lift the thing up and set it in my garage. You can see the date I've had this thing for many years. You can see the date on this slide right here down at the bottom right, 1997. That's when I bought it. So that's when I brought it home. I had the wrecker truck there. They lifted the thing out of the pickup, put it in, put it in my garage in 1997. And guess where it is today? Exactly. Yeah, you're not moving that thing. <laughs> still in, still in the garage. Yeah. There's, yeah uh it's 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 a monster oh it's a monster. very 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 rare um uh, a little bit about these instruments uh well this instrument is a phelps uh compass they were the predecessor to uh a w and le girly and then after phelps uh, uh 
Gurley bought into the company. So this is a Phelps and Gurley instrument. Again, the predecessor to WNLE Gurley. And then eventually Phelps, they brought out Phelps and it became WNLE Gurley. So they were predecessor makers uh, to the Gurley, to the Gurley name. Um, let's see here. This is a Rittenhouse compass, Benjamin Rittenhouse. Uh, his brother, David Rittenhouse, is very well known. David Rittenhouse is American man of science, uh, contemporary of, uh, of Benjamin Franklin, made scientific instruments, made telescopes, uh, very, very well, well known, made a, just a few compasses, one of which is in the Smithsonian. But his brother, Benjamin, also was a maker. Uh, uh, the most rare instrument is probably a David Rittenhouse, this guy's brother, uh, probably the most rare maker, but this is uh, Benjamin. And this one has had a level vial added, but there at the bottom, it says B Rittenhouse, but unfortunately the level vial has been put over the top of the Rittenhouse. This would probably be a eight or $9,000 compass something like that retail. Um, some, other, some other makers here. Uh, this is a Potts compass, early Virginia maker, uh, very rare. This is a Thomas Whitney maker, Philadelphia. And Whitney is well known because uh, Whitney made the instruments for the made compasses for the hand compasses for the Lewis and Clark expedition. The, the Thomas Whitney compass, a small box compass that Lewis and Clark carried with them is in the Smithsonian. You can go look at it. They don't have it out. Smithsonian doesn't have any instruments out. They've all got them in the back in the warehouse. They're hard to get to. You have to know somebody to get to them. You can't just go there and look at this stuff. But Thomas Whitney was an excellent maker in, uh, uh, in Philadelphia. Now, this engraving, uh, this is a North Arrow. And as you look at that, I mean, this is blown up. You know, in, in real size, this is, what, a half inch tall? And this has been engraved in the brass face of the compass. So if you can, you know, the, the craftsmanship, the artis the uh, artisanry to engrave that with a knife or a scalpel, uh, something of course is harder than the brass. So you can actually make, you can cut it, you can make the engraving, but all that's been engraved uh, in the instrument, uh, in the compass face. And then what you're looking at is once it's engraved, then they put this ink dye so down in the in the piece in the part that's been cut out. So what you're looking at is a, is a notch that's been engraved and then filled with ink, and that's actually what you see. You have to get almost a microscope down there to look at this to to kind of appreciate it. But it, the the craftsmanship that went into that's just just unbelievable. This is a Draper compass. And look at that North arrow. You know, they've, you know, the way it's been shadowed there and the fine lines, those lines are sub millimeter apart. They're tiny. It's just, just, just unbelievable how they do that. There's another one. So the, that's what to the collectors, that's what really gets the collectors excited are, uh, uh, is artisanry like that. Uh, some other compasses, uh, Greg and Roop, uh, New York, uh, Hobby, New York. The New York makers, they like to put flowers. They decorated their compasses with these floral uh, arrangement. So most of the New York makers, uh, the, the compass face is decorated with these flowers. And there's right there are two, are two examples. Uh, 
King from uh, Baltimore. And, you know, to me, the, uh, again, this is McGarity, New York, you know, how that was, uh, how that, how that was made is what kind of gets, gets folks like me excited. Uh, compasses came in all different sizes. The one on the left there is a, almost a demi compass. I need a scale here to kind of get some idea, but uh, the one in the middle is the more standard kind of a, a compass. And then the one on the right, that's one of those uh, railroad compasses, which are pretty good size. And uh, uh, they've got a lot of brass in them. They're pretty heavy. One of the improvements to compasses, uh, this one, was made by uh, A.S. Alo in St. Louis. And this one has a four screw leveling head like a transit. Uh, so some, they just had a knuckle joint that you tightened and a bullseye bubble or two cross level vials leveled the instrument. But this one goes on a like a transit like a tripod and the four leveling screws. And then also this one is equipped with a telescope, as you can see there, that slips down uh, over the sights. Uh, pretty, this one would have been made, oh, a low was in business in the early 1900s. This would probably date 1910, something like that, maybe a little earlier, something on that order. Here's a really rare one. This is a gimbaled uh, compass. This was, I'm not a mine, I'm not an underground mine surveyor at all, but these have little bitty short stubby uh, sites, uh, sight veins, and it's gimbaled so that you can look up and down uh, shafts with it. Uh, so it, it, it rotates there, uh, the compass rotates or is gimbaled in the, uh, in the frame. Very, very rare. I have Oh, and round numbers, 70 or 80 compasses, but I think we only have three gimbaled compasses. That'd give you some idea how rare those are. Uh, Blattner was a, I follow a lot the St. Louis makers. Blattner was an early St. Louis Did maker. Did I just hear Aaron's not going? Did I just hear Aaron's not going? Uh, Blattner was a, in St. Louis, uh, immigrated there from Switzerland, and uh, was he was making compasses by about 1830, which for St. Louis was, was fairly early. And here are some Blattner compasses that I set out. Uh, here he is, that was his, uh, Jacob Blattner was the gentleman's name. Uh, there's his engraving on his compass, very fine work. Uh, he too uh, patented different kinds of instruments. This is one with, a, with folding standards. I don't know why you'd want to do that. I've never seen one. It may be easier to, uh, to carry around or to, you know, to pack. But I know you're making that. There's the patent, but I've, I've never seen one. This is a telescopic compass. Most makers, this is a compass, a standard compass, but they've added standards on it with a telescope. So it's, they've replaced the sights uh, with a telescope. Most makers did this. Gurley did this, Blattner did this. So they're, they're more rare, uh, but kind of an, an advance on the, standard, uh, on the standard American compass. Did you do all of those wood bases just for your collection? I'm sorry? Is that wood base just for your collection, for your? Uh, yeah, I made, actually my father made a bunch of those. Okay. Uh, when we take them to shows or he and I used to do that, but I mean, even today when I take the instruments to shows, they're hard to set up. You know, you can't put a Jacob staff up, you can't put a tripod up. So I've made a whole bunch of these little stands, little wood stands to put them on, kind of for display purposes. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. They look pretty cute, actually. So. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, this is a, a standard ASLO compass, St. Louis. 
Young Compass, uh, Philadelphia. Young used a bullseye bubble on most of his instruments, not the cross level vials, but the bullseye bubble. Uh, Beckman, Toledo, Ohio. This instrument would have been made probably in the 1920s or 30s. Beckman was kind of late to the game. This is a Dietzkin, actually, that my father used in the 70s and 80s. Dietzkin, this was probably in the Dietzkin catalog up until the 1950s or 1960s, but it's a, uh, you know, good for timber cruising in our part of the world. Timber cruisers use this kind of instrument, you know, in, in the 1950s, 1960s, timber companies. Uh, let's see here now. Let me get on over. These are just some examples of other makers that I'm going to, if you're, if you're now let's, okay, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. Now, let me talk about uh, this instrument, which is a solar compass. So this is the uh, ad. Uh, this was in the Indiana Gazetteer 1861, which advertised John S. Hoffam as a philosophical and mathematical instrument maker. That meant microscopes, telescopes, compasses, uh, barometers. Uh, he made all that stuff as most of the makers did. But this is a, just about an unknown, unheard of maker. And here's the gentleman. I've researched his life, wrote a couple articles about him. There's the gentleman right there. He was an academic, uh, really, he was, a, he was really an academic. He wasn't an instrument maker. But here's a solar compass, which has his name on it. So he's got his name on it, he's the maker. But nobody can imagine that he made this instrument. Hard to see, but there's his name, Franklin, Indiana, which is just south of Indianapolis. But this is the solar compass. This was the the living end to compasses. Uh, of course, compass, you know, were a slave to gravity. And uh, in the GLO surveys, you know, if, if <laughs> because of local attraction um, and because of changes in variation, you know, the lines started being crooked. And so uh, William uh, Austin Burt invented this solar compass. And it, uh, uh, it solves uh, the PZS triangle mechanically, which is a, a just an unbelievable feat that uh, William Austin Burt would have dreamed this up. Uh, he was uneducated, but somehow he was a he, he he was a genius. But he developed this solar compass and he patented it. William uh, Young made the first batch of them. He let his patent run out. So this instrument here by Hoffman would have been made about 18, the early 1860s sometime. But this is a solar compass, very, very, very rare, very, very valuable. Uh, there was recently a solar, an aluminum solar compass by Gurley that sold kind of the last public auction. And it was on the order of $20,000, something like that. So that'd give you some idea of what solar compasses are worth by a rare maker. So this instrument, you, uh, well, <laughs> you, need to, you need to read my ephemeris, but uh, this thing, if you, know, if you know certain things about the celestial bodies, uh, you can set this instrument such that it points to true north. And the real quick way of describing it is a sundial. How does a sundial work? You know, what do you have to know to make a sundial work? You know, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts will know this, but to make a sundial work, the gnomon, which casts the shadow, has to be set at the latitude of the location where the sundial is going to set. And the other thing you have to do, you have to rotate the sundial so that the gnomon points to true north. So those are two parts of this celestial equation that we have to solve. 
So we have the latitude and we have the direction. And then the sundial is built in a way such that depending on if the sun is high in the sky in the summertime or low in the sky, that's called declination, the shadow that's cast accounts for that. And so then when the sun is on the local horizon, when, the, when it's noon, when the sun is straight up and down noon, you can tell what time it is. That's the way a sundial works. Well, this thing is kind of a backwards sundial. You set, the, you set the latitude of the observation in the instrument. You set the declination of the sun in, which is accounted for in the, uh, in the sundial. Uh, and you have to know kind of what time it is. You have to set the hour circle. And then once you have those things set in the instrument, you rotate the instrument until the sun is down a pointer, which I've kind of illustrated there. And when that happens, the instrument is aligned to true north. So that's in one minute, that's how it's a little more complicated than that, but in one minute, that's how the uh, a solar compass works. And William Austin Burt was the genius that, uh, that dreamed that up. Uh, this one is by, by Hoffman. So great, great instruments. Uh, and our GLO, our GLO in Missouri was done by 1845. So there were no solar compasses used in Missouri um, at all. Uh, the Western states, yes, but not here and not, <clears throat> and not east. A couple of exceptions to that, but not very many. Um, this Hoffam compass, uh, this gentleman right here, John Hoffam, one of these collecting stories. Um, I'd never heard of this. This antique dealer in Indiana had it and he knew I collected stuff. And so I bought it from this antique dealer. And I, I immediately knew that this was a, a never heard of before maker. And uh, there are some reference books you can go to, which I did, which I knew all about them, but I could not find this guy as a maker. So I got on the, I called the county surveyor over in Franklin County, Indiana. I said, hey, do you know any Huffams? Kind of an, un and he said, yeah, there's some around here. And so I said, well, would you mind contacting some of them or getting some phone numbers? Because I'd like to talk to them to find out some more information about this John Hoffman. And he did. And so I called this guy, his name was Robert Hoffman. And I said, I'm gonna be, uh, be in Indianapolis here in a few months. Could I come talk to you about this John Hoffman? He said, oh yeah, sure, that'd be fine. And so, and he knew, it turns out this John Hoffman was like a great, great, great uncle or something like that. So I visited this gentleman, Robert Hoffman, a descendant. And I went in and I talked to him and I said, well, um, this, your relative was this, you know, unusual maker and he made this solar compass. They're very, very, very rare. Uh, you know, I, can you tell me anything about them? And the old guy was sitting there and he said, uh, Mildred, he said, uh, go back there in the bedroom and bring out that box. So Mildred dutifully goes off to the bedroom, comes back out, set the box up there, pulls the top off the box, and there's an absolute twin to my solar compass. I thought I had the only one in the world, and Mildred has one under the bed back there. So it was just, it was just unbelievable that there's another one. I told the gentleman, I said, now, you know, this is very, very rare, you know, you ought to do something with it, maybe give it to the county museum. And he since has passed, but he gave it to the uh, gave it to the county, the county museum. So it's in it's in good hands. The only two known uh, are those two, mine and, and that one. Uh, let's see here. So this is a, uh, a solar transit. It has it's a it's a girly transit with a solar attachment on top pretty rare. These are other solar instruments, solar compasses and a solar transit. These are mining instruments. 
The auxiliary side telescopes are for looking up and down shafts. I'm not a mining surveyor, but I'm told that's, that's what they're used for. Uh, this is one of the first transits in America. It was made by Young. Uh, three minute least count. It has a cut circle. It looks like a compass, but it's got a cut circle in there. One in Smithsonian, just absolutely identical uh, to this one. Uh, this is a mountain light transit, a very small instrument used in the, in the mountains for surveys out there, pretty rare, some parts made of aluminum. These are more uh, mountain instruments or explorers instruments, very small. These are less than the size of a Coke can. I need something for scale there. Very, very small instruments. Here's one made by Whistler in St. Louis. Tiny, tiny explorer instrument, very, very rare. And then um, now here's some real low level instruments. These are little <laughs> contractors levels or gardeners levels or landscaper levels. Um, they're, you know, they're $25, $50 on a good day. No self-respecting surveyor would be seen using one of these things. These are convertible levels. There's quite a few, there's a lot of these around. They're called convertible levels because they're a Y level and you can take the telescope out of the Ys and then attach it like the one on the bottom left there to those axles and it converts into a transit. And there's a circle there, a rough circle where you can measure uh, horizontal angles. So all of those are Y levels you see. So we can take the telescope out, turn it. The one in the top center there, that thing's been dipped. Don't ever do that. It's, I put that in here to show people not what to do. It's been in some acid dip and all the paint and the lacquer has been taken off of it. It's, to a collector, it's worth absolutely zero. Absolutely zero. What's These are allodades for what, plane tables, uh, okay. mapping instruments. So, what's uh, what's some of the optic ranges on some of those mountain rain, mountain transits and stuff? How far, what kind of distance can you expect to get out of some of the optics of those? Um, well, we're talking <laughs> about sites that are on the order of probably you know a few hundred feet, okay. you know maybe a thousand feet. Generally, the 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 lenses and the in these telescopes, they're not spectacular of this era. Yeah. You know, they're not like a wild T1, you know, let's put it that way. Right. You know, right. The, the optics are, you know, not that great. And on these allodades, of course, these were for mapping. And so, you know, the, you know, the uh, the shots, the four, you know, the four sites were a couple hundred feet on a good day. You know, that was about it. Gotcha. These are chains, uh, public land survey system. They come in different lengths, uh, half chain, 33 foot, full chain, 66 foot, and then the engineer's chain, which are 100 foot. And of course the 100 footers are one foot lengths, railroad chains or engineer's chains. These things are real variable in price. Uh, the best ones, the makers are marked on them. Uh, and others they're not, but they're from, oh, from 250 to $800, something like that. Very, very collectible. So this is a gimbaled plummet lamp. These are used in the mines. Uh, it's gimbaled so it can hang from the ceiling for a backside or a foresight. And the little, the little bullet looking thing, that's where you put your oil in and a wick comes out so you can light it. So it has like a candle, so you can, you know, you can take sights in the mines. Uh, these, this, this is the only set I've ever seen. It's never been used. It's made by K&E. It's never been lit. Uh, and these plumb bob collectors are crazy. There's some plumb bob collector out there that would, I, I think I could probably get seven or eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 out of this, just, unbelievable to we surveyors but it won't be a surveyor that'll want this it'll be some mining uh 
engineer, mining uh, collector, or plumb bob collector. Uh, not, not, not a, not a muddy boots a surveyor. <laughs> Curta calculators, type one, type twos. Uh, some have a loom, some have a metal can, some have uh, plastic cans. Uh, the early ones are type ones, the later ones are type twos. These things have gotten really expensive. Uh, oh, on a, the low end would be probably now four or $500. And on the high end for a good early type one with the metal can, probably $1,100, $1,200. They are, they've gotten really, really expensive. And not just surveyors had those, these time, speed and distance car rally people and mathematicians, they're, they are cross collectibles. Lots of folks want these things. Yeah, I'm looking at a few of them on eBay and they're 2,000, 2,400 or a few. Oh, well, yeah. see, I'm, yeah. I'm out of the loop there, Trent. Yeah, they are very, <laughs> very And they're, they, the collectors are worldwide. I've sold a couple of them. One went to Italy and one went to uh, Australia. Oh, my goodness. Um, you might say, well, how do you learn about this stuff? How do you know about this stuff? Well, in 1962, uh, Charles Smart, who worked for Gurley, wrote a book. He wrote a catalog of all the known American, American makers at that time. Uh, it's bad out of date now, but there's, there's the Bible for collectors. And then instrument catalogs. A uh, collector like me has hundreds of of uh, catalogs like that to reference material. And then folks say, well, where do you, where do you keep all this stuff? Well, there's, there's my basement. So there's one picture. And then here's another picture that in my fireproof uh, uh, vault uh, of a basement where I, where I keep the stuff. So that's the end of the slides. I think we're about approaching the end of the end of the allotted time here. Uh, I'd be happy to to answer any questions that you all might have, uh, or if in the future you have a question or something you want to email me. Uh, let's see, Trent. How do how do these folks get my email? I mean, yeah. I'm, when I do the follow up email this week, I'll I'll throw it on there and just say. Yeah. If anybody has questions? Yeah, Elgin at Rollinet.org. But uh, yep. yeah, and I'll be happy to to give folks an idea what uh, instruments might be worth and uh, how rare it is, you know, kind of what you have. Every once in a while, I get questions. I say, well, you know, what do I have here? You know, is this is this junk or is it something? Because you know, you can't tell. Is it is it fifty dollars, five hundred dollars? or $5,000, you know, uh, sometimes it's hard for folks that don't first collect to deal with this stuff to really know, but I, I can, I can tell you what you have. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, awesome. happy to try. At the, at the risk of giving away my age, uh, I will tell you when I started surveying, Curta was standard equipment. If you didn't have one of those, you weren't getting any work done. Yep. Yep. No, that's right. They were great devices and they were made in Liechtenstein, it turns out. Um, uh, and there's a, on YouTube, there's a video, an animation of how these things work. And if you want to be fascinated, uh, the gentleman that dreamed this up, go on YouTube and put, put Curta calculator animation or something in that. It is, it's the dead gun, this thing you ever saw. Yep. My first, my first party chief just flat amazed me with the, with the speed he could do calculations. Yeah. I mean, he would do slope reductions and, and traverse calculations. And it, it was, it was amazing what a good tool. And basically it's a slide rule. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a mechanical mechanical slide rail. Yeah, great devices. Lichtenstein of all places. <laughs> Anybody else got anything? I have a question. Have you oh. ever used these uh, instruments in the field and tested them, or they're more for 
looking? No, um, my father, uh, old school surveyor uh, here in the Ozarks, uh, this would have been in the 60s, uh, has done, did some compass survey. Most of it was for mark and line. But I mean, he used some of these instruments. Uh, and of course, Henry Seip in West Virginia is the, the father of all compass surveyors. He wrote a book called Compass Surveying in 1974, of all things. You know, he was, he wrote this book about how to do it in 1974. That's pretty late, you know. But so from my father, I mean, you, you know, I learned how you do this. And uh, uh, I've done some little airs analysis on, you know, how much air could we expect from, a, you know, from using a, a, a standard American compass and a chain. And, you know, there's lots of factors that would contribute to the errors in setting the public, the GLO set in public land surveys. So I've done a little errors analysis. Some of that was based on, you know, some real testing. The solar compass is very, uh, very complex. Years ago, I could do I could do observations using the solar compass. I'd have to think about it a little bit these days, <laughs> but it would be the most advanced, uh, the most advanced instrument. But no, I'm yeah, I'm familiar with the with the how to use them and the and their associated errors. What was the error analysis that you um, determined? Yeah, well, for example, uh, let's see if I can do this off the top of my head, but a, uh, but for example, um, I probably can't do it off the top of my head, but here's the errors. Okay, the compass, the least count of the compass is about a half a degree. All right, so you're running a mile a line. So let's suppose you're off by a half a degree for a mile. Okay, that'd be the possible angular uh, distant air. And then the chaining, you know, the uh, uh, the chain's going to be well if you've standardized it or not standardized it. And then the four sites and the back sites for compass surveying, you know, they're going to be in the woods where we are, in the hills where we are, they're going to be maximum distance is going to be 200 feet, 300 feet, something like that. So, you know, you take the number of sites, so it'd be the square root of N times, you know, whatever that error is would be the expected error over the thing. So anyway, in round numbers, you know, for a, for a quarter corner, to be not on the split here by a matter of, oh, uh, 10 feet, 15 feet, no worries. You know, that's, that, that, that's, you know, that's easily within what you could expect in an air, uh, from a compass survey air. And there's, there's a whole lot of factors there, but, the long and the short of it is, you know, if you find a yellow stone and it's not at the split from two others by 10 or 15 feet, are you going to worry about it? And in my world, the answer is no, we're not going to worry about it. Interesting. Um, second question, uh, as the technology or instruments got better, when would you say was that time period where they got more accurate or more, I don't know, better i guess <laughs> not really well word, the big but. the big chains would would have been when transits came into common use which you know transits had supplanted compasses for most boundary survey work by 1900 you know something like that although compasses still were around for 20 30 years after that so I would say the big difference would have been with the introduction of the standard American transit to replace the uh, to replace the compass. Thank you. Nice. Good question, hey, Richard. Richard, have you ever heard of a Merrill and Davis 
uh, instrument maker out of New York? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, I don't have, no, I've not. And I don't have my smart catalog book here in front of me, but David Ingram has a website. It's uh, surveyhistory.org. Okay. He, that's the best, that's the best online reference. David has spent some years with help from a bunch of us collectors uh, kind of updating SMART. And so surveyhistory.org. And uh, it needs some updating and Dave's promised to do that. But as far as a listing, that would be the best, that'd be the best source. Okay, yeah, I was just asking because I've got one of his compasses and I was told he's only manufacturing them for about three, four, five years, something like that, about 1835. Yeah, now, all that entirely possible. Uh, if, if I had my smart book here, I could take a look. Uh, the smart book's out of print, but uh, uh, if you want to email me, I mean, I could, if it's in smart, I could, you know, scan sure. that and email it back to you. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. I'll uh, I'll get your email. Okay, uh, if you want to write down, it's my last name Elgin E L G I N at, and then Rollinet R O L L A N E T dot org. Got it. Elgin at Rollinet dot org. Perfect. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll send you a picture too. Sure. Yep. 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 I'll throw a, let me throw that in the chat real quick too. So have you started your own museum yet? <laughs> no, uh, folks correctly say, what are you going to do with all this stuff someday? And it's a good, uh, it's a good question. Uh, Regrettably, the Smithsonian doesn't want your stuff. Uh, now they've looked at my stuff and they want the good stuff. You know, they want the real good stuff. They don't want, uh, you know, they don't want the, uh, you know, they don't want the mediocre stuff. Uh, and there was a surveying museum in, uh, uh, Springfield, Illinois, for a few years, but financially it, it it didn't make a go of it. So there's not a good repository. Uh, there's not a good repository uh, if folks want to donate or give instruments. Regrettably, no no good place to go with it these days. So Scholarship it, auctions. That's <laughs> it's about where it, that's about where it goes to now, unfortunately. Yeah. So, so Richard, based based on your bio, you and I are about the same age. Uh, I turned down warrant officer officer flight school in 1968. Figured I, I was in live, it. I would I wouldn't live through it. Uh, <laughs> I did barely. <laughs> yeah, well, I figured two tours and now I wasn't going to get it done. But I, I am a, an orphan and I am available for adoption if you need someone to leave that to. <laughs> well, uh, I have two children that are not interested in the stuff at all. They're professionals. They're off doing other things. They're not engineers or surveyors. So uh, you might watch the obituaries in the local paper <laughs> And on my death, you know, show up, there's going to be a hell of a hell of a garage sale there by my kids, you know, a week or so after they put me in the ground. So. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of sad to hear, but, <laughs> but I think I have the same situation going on in my family too. Yeah. That's a bummer. Well, make sure uh, you put your offer prices on there for when they're for sale, not the retail <laughs> prices. <laughs> That was awesome. Anybody else got any more questions that they want to kind of lead with? I had uh, written a, a comment to Richard uh, asking him, what, what do you think one would expect to pay for that larger 
uh, Gurley Railroad Compass? Yeah, uh, it'll depend on original box or not, what kind of shapes it in. But, you know, retail, uh, a, a, a not so good shape retail is probably fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600. And a good one with excellent finish, original box, every, everything is there, probably $3,000, $3,200, something like that. Ka-ching. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good to know. Thank you. Richard, we, we have a, an auction out here every year for scholarships as part of our conference. If you're looking for a place to, to uh, maybe repurpose some of your equipment, we would love to see some of it go, go to help our students out here. And we and support we, just, we support both both Nevada and California pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have uh, I have given some of my instruments to the Army Corps of Engineers, and they move it around in visitor centers. Is what huh. they do with it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some in Kansas and there's some in Missouri. Uh, kind of representative uh, representative stuff. Uh, do you all, do you have raffles for that equipment or how do you do that? We'll do exactly, it. That's exactly what we do. We, uh, we have a, a big scholarship auction at the conference almost every year. We, we didn't really have one last year, but almost every year. And, and we raised quite a bit of money for students in Nevada and in California. Uh -huh. A lot of your pieces would be more like live auction stuff that we have. And so, um, everything could be donated through the 501c3 through the education yeah. foundation. So yeah. same with, uh, well, Rob you McMillan all is joint, on here. Rob you all have joint, do you have joint conferences? Yes. yes. When's the next live joint conference? Next, uh, we're working on next, uh, late March. It'll be in Las Vegas working on multi-state, um, for sure. California, I think Nevada and Arizona, and then we've invited a few other states. So, well, Yep. Looking way ahead, I mean, I I speak at uh, state association conferences. Mm -hmm. I've not spoken to that one, yep. uh, Good but I have I have several different seminar topics, and uh, I could give the the live version of this. Yeah, uh, and then what I've done for some of those is I've driven there and brought a truckload of equipment and then set it out and then be able to talk about it, you know, and yeah. have it sitting there at the convention. That's cool. So I'll, uh, and, I'll, I'll do an introduction to uh, Chrissy who runs the, our kind of our conference. So I'll do yeah. that this week. She, I, I have sent some letters, the folks in the Midwest, I've spoken in uh, Oregon and Washington. I've not spoken in California. Uh, Colorado, Idaho, New Mexico is about as far out that way that I've gone. And to all those, well, not to Idaho, I flew there, but to New Mexico, I drove and took instruments out uh, about two years ago. Okay. Yeah, I'll, so, I'll, I'll do an introduction email for you for sure. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, David put in the pad, I don't know if you saw that in the chat, but the uh, the Marilyn Davis partnership operating in New York city from 1835 to 1837. So. Okay. Where do I see that? In the chat, uh, Dave Malone had, had saw it on that surveyhistory.org and then just kind of threw it in the chat real quick, but there is some information on there. So okay. at, the very, at the very bottom, if you're still trying to get there, you can just hover over and it, you'll see the chat at the bottom of the screen there. Um, I maybe. don't. Maybe okay. I see stream. I think that's on some. Uh, might be on Richard's computer that I'm looking at. Yeah. I, it don't, that's okay. Okay. Yep. Anyway, oh, there I, was, Dave did find some information on that survey. It's on that more. Yeah. There we go. I got it. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Perfect. And then I put the the email in there as well. If you want to verify that so 
Thank you. All right. Hey, uh, Richard, I got one more question. Go for Sorry. it, Andrew. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier. Uh, did you have a favorite instrument and why, or maybe like a top five favorite? Yeah. Well, I've, I have spent a lot of time researching the Chanley family. So if I had a choice, anything, any of the Chanley instruments would be, uh, uh, would be favorites of mine. They're exquisitely made. They're rare. Uh, they're, they're, they're great, great, great instruments. And one uh, collecting story, uh, several years ago, would have been about 10 years ago or so, there was a Chandley compass that was sold at auction, Cowan's Auctions in uh, Cincinnati. And uh, it went for about $60,000. Wow. And it was admittedly, it had good provenance, good solid provenance with the family where it was used it was in great 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 shape so that that give you some you know that, that that's another reason why you wow. know I, I like Chanley's yeah the most valuable one would be by David Rittenhouse that's why you need to stop at every yard sale that you go by and look for a David Rittenhouse compass the probability you find in one is near zero but who knows what else you might find at the uh, at the yard sale but a David Rittenhouse compass there's only like four or five of them known, but if somebody was to come come up with one that was proven to be one of his, um, oh, there's probably a museum someplace. It'd be it'd be a quarter of a million dollar instrument. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Don't mistake in the D for a B, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make it, oh, well, then the uh, the other thing you have to watch out for, Benjamin Rittenhouse, David's brother, had a son named David, who was a maker. Oh. So now you better be careful because it could be the other <laughs> David Rittenhouse, <laughs> the nephew, not the real guy, the nephew. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, I think it's good stuff. Thank Very you, Dan. Good. That was excellent. Enjoyed yes. it tremendously. Very good Enjoyed stuff. it. Yeah. Well, nice to see you all. If there's something I can do for you, have a question, feel free to drop me an email. Yeah, I'll throw it in the, uh, when I do the follow-up email, so for sure. Very good. I'll, Very good. I'll do an introduction email with Chrissy for the conference. Yeah, that'd be great. Appreciate well, it. Thank you, Richard. It was great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is a great presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you all have a good week. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye, guys. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.